Tonight, the TV regulator confirms it's investigating GB News after sexist comments were made by a presenter. But the boss of Ofcom tells me we're not talking enough about protecting freedom of expression. I've been speaking to Dame Melanie Dawes, who says while there are real issues around misogyny in public life, she doesn't want the regulator to shoot from the hip. Also tonight, our hearts are broken. The family of Eliane Andon, fatally stabbed in South London, paid tribute as the 15-year-old's death sparks a political row between the government and the London mayor. And after the US Secretary of State showcased his guitar skills, we've had a look at other politicians who've tried to strike a chord with voters. All that and more with the former Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, and the former Arts Minister, Ed Vasey, here to give their take for the next hour. It's Thursday, I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. So the GB News sexism row, which started after one of its presenters made misogynistic comments about a journalist, continued today, with the media regulator Ofcom confirming it's investigating. It's received more than 7,000 complaints, and one of the presenters involved, Dan Wooten, today had his contract with Mail Online terminated. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pontificate about GB News. Frankly, I don't think that would be appropriate from someone who works for another broadcaster. Viewers can make their own minds up. But what I do want to talk about tonight is the media landscape and how it's regulated. You'll hear my interview with the head of Ofcom, Dame Melanie Dawes, in a few moments, which, I'll be honest, it was a little bit like interviewing your boss. Um, but something really jumped out to me from that interview because she said that the rules regarding impartiality in broadcasting haven't changed in 20 years and that that was a good thing, a good thing, because of stability. Well, in the last 20 years, the media landscape has been anything but stable. 20 years ago, Twitter hadn't even been invented. It would take another 10 years for TikTok to come onto the scene. It's been reported that GB News is looking at moving some of its pro programmes off of broadcast and making them streaming only, which would mean that just like the tech giants, Netflix and YouTube, Ofcom wouldn't have any powers over them. So are we really saying that the current system of regulation is able to keep up? So that's what we're going to be discussing in the first part of tonight's show. First, here's my conversation with the head of Ofcom, and it started with details of the current investigation. We've announced today that we've opened a formal investigation into that show on GB News on Tuesday night. Um, we received a number of complaints and we're investigating it under our rules for offence. So uh, that's hot off the press uh, and the work continues. And what does that mean? Are you thinking about calling in management to talk to them? Will you be interviewing people? No, look, it's good to have a chance actually to explain how it works because I know there's been quite a lot of concern and people have been talking about, uh, about how this works. Um, but fundamentally, um, there are rules that are set out in law by Parliament that require standards to be maintained for due impartiality and due accuracy for news and current affairs and for audiences to be protected from harm and serious offence in all broadcasting. Uh, but all of that needs to be done while upholding freedom of expression. So what Ofcom has to do when we have a case like this is weigh all that up gather the facts, be really clear which part of the broadcasting code we think is a concern, talk to the broadcaster, and then, as we've done today, open an investigation if we think that's needed. But we don't shoot from the hip, and I think the public doesn't want a regulator that just gives a knee-jerk response. I'll be honest, I feel like it's quite unusual for you to be doing an interview now, in the middle of a live investigation. It's the kind of bid we'll normally put in and then not hear anything back from. Is that an admission that you know you haven't been tough enough to this point? No, look, I know that there's been a lot of interest in this. Um, and it's concern been, as well. Yeah, there has. There's been real concern. And, look, I, I don't want to comment particularly on the show because it is now subject to a live investigation, but I think we know that, you know, there are real issues around misogyny more widely in our public discourse. We know for our own res from our own research at Ofcom that women are much more likely to get a hard time on social media than men and more likely to feel really affected by that. So there are definitely wider issues here, but our job is to make sure after programmes have aired, that we look at all the facts uh, and that we act in a way that's in accordance with our processes and with our rules, and that's what we've done this week. There's also concern about elected politicians having their own shows and interviewing another, other, other elected politicians on them. I mean, so tonight, for example, the Conservative Party Deputy Chair Lee Anderson interviewing the Conservative Party Home Secretary Suella Braverman. I mean, is that right? Well, look, we are a post-broadcast regulator, um, so we look at programmes after they've been aired. We've and seen it many times before, haven't we? 
Yeah, well, look, there are rules it's on there are rules on politicians not being able to present the news. Those are actually set out by Parliament really clearly in the primary legislation. But when it comes to current affairs, and we've said this recently on a judgment uh, last week, in fact, it is possible for politicians to present a show, provided that they meet the due impartiality rules and the due accuracy rules. And that doesn't mean equal balance of views, but it does mean that a sufficiently wide range of views needs to be brought to bear. Do you really think that's happening on GB News with multiple Conservative politicians, some of them members of the government, presenting their own shows? Well, look, we've opened up audience research into this because actually the rules haven't changed over the last 20 years and I think that's a really good thing to have that stability but what has changed is our media landscape. We've got more and more shows coming in on TV and radio but also we've got that wider social media landscape. I think a lot of the time what people are seeing uh, is actually clips on social media which don't represent the whole programme. Um, it's Ofcom's job to look at programmes once they've been aired in the round and see whether, if you're talking about impartiality, whether that's been preserved across the programme as a whole. I guess some people might find that quite extraordinary what you just said, that it's a good thing that the rules haven't changed in 20 years. I mean, many people would say that's a really bad thing because the landscape has changed so dramatically. Gordon Brown last night, for example, said, you know, because we've got a far wider range of broadcasters, the system of regulation is not good enough to cope for it. Ofcom needs to have more teeth. He's right, isn't he? Well, look, certainly the government is opening up in the media bill the need to extend the number of services that we regulate uh, to make sure that some of the streamers, for example, are caught by some form of broadcasting code that looks rather similar to what we do now for TV and radio. But um, I just want to say that freedom of expression, I think, is sometimes perhaps not as prominent, prominent in these debates as I think it should be. Um, the rules are designed to uphold standards, particularly for news and current affairs, but also to preserve freedom of expression. And that's not just the freedom of expression of the broadcaster or the opinion former or the presenter. It's actually the freedom of the audience to hear a wide range of views. So, well, even stuff like what Lawrence Fox said. I mean, well, we are investigating that programme clearly. I mean, that's for taking freedom of expression to a real, you know, far extremes. Mm -hmm. Well, we are investigating that and we've announced that today. But... I do think that, you know, the stability and flexibility of the rules has actually served us well over the years. There is a question about which services are covered by them. And as I said, we've definitely opened up audience research to get views from the public on the question of politicians presenting news and current affairs. Um, you're talking about the different priority of the media, social media, broadcasting, print. It feels to me like the landscape has changed so dramatically. People mm. are using different medias, listening to different mm. medias. You have presenters who are acting on different... Um, media as well. Would it be better to have a cohesive system, bringing it all together, rather than a jigsaw piece? Mm. Look, I think that's a really good question, and we've done a lot of work at Ofcom, and we're doing more right now, looking at actually that question of the wider social media landscape in particular, because our research shows that if you get your news mostly from social media, from a social media feed, actually you find it harder to discriminate between real and fake news, and you're more likely actually to get stuck in a rabbit hole where you don't actually see anybody else's views on important topics. So we do think that's important, and there's not very much transparency about how those feeds are constructed or how we all get fed the diet of news uh, and the mix of that in our day-to-day -day use of social media. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about as well um, is GB News in particular. So Michelle Donnellan um, spoke to me last night saying that the Lawrence Fox interview was an isolated incident. She doesn't have any wider concerns about the channel. Do you have wider concerns about the channel? Well, we've opened up a number of investigations. How many investigations? We've actually got nine ongoing live investigations and then a number that have already concluded. So, uh, you know, we do have a lot of engagement with GB News right now. But as I said, you know, we welcome diversity of different programming and I believe the rules are flexible and allow different perspectives uh, to be able to brought to bear. So do you think without GB News there's a risk that the broadcasting culture is too similar? Well, I certainly think diversity and plurality is important. Um, and so, as I said, freedom of expression, I think, is really important for us to remember in these debates. Uh, Ofcom's job is to uphold that while also maintaining standards. And, you know, overall, I think our system works because when you look at the data, you can see that the public's trust in TV and radio news is higher than for any other form of media. So I think... We are getting quite a lot right across our system, and that's testament to broadcasters such as Sky and some of our other national broadcasters actually delivering really, really high-quality news and current affairs to the public. I feel like a lot of people 
listening to what you're saying will think you sound quite complacent. You mm. think that the current system works and they'll be looking at things like what happened mm. with Lawrence Fox and um, with Dan Whitten. I mean, I watched it. It's quite sh I was quite shocked by it, I'll be honest. Mm. Um, they'll be looking at the fact that Lee Anderson is boasting about having the first UK soil broadcast exclusive with the Home Secretary, someone who he works with, uh, his colleague, and thinking, why aren't you more worried? Well, look, I don't want to come across as complacent, clearly. We've got a really important job to do here at Ofcom, but I think we've shown by our track record that we do act. As I say, we have a number of investigations open already into GB News, um, more uh, ongoing, and these standards are very, very important. But at the same time, the tools that Parliament has given us here are really important ones, and the need to ensure freedom of expression means that we don't use them lightly. So we will always work with broadcasters to try and help them get their compliance into order um, you know, as a priority. Being honest with you, I've been a broadcaster for 10 years. I've always been slightly terrified of Ofcom. Um, you know, now I'm wondering, did I get it all wrong? Are the rules actually way more flexible than I ever realised? No, look, I think you can see, as I said, from the fact that the public really trusts our TV news, that we're getting a lot right in this country. And that's higher than you see in other countries, and I think it is a testament to the actual sort of stability and clarity and the standards in our regulatory framework. But there's a serious point I want to make here, though. I feel like the system works because people self-regulate because of a fear of Ofcom. But now with a load of new players who are pushing boundaries, testing limits, it feels like the curtain's been pulled back. There aren't any terrifying powers. It's a bit like the Wizard of Oz. Mm. Well, I, I really don't buy that. As I said, we've got a lot of investigations open at the moment. And we have shown in the past that, you know, where we see a problem, we will act uh, very quickly sometimes, as we've actually done this week, I think. Um, and we will make sure that if something has gone wrong, that we find that broadcaster in breach once we've looked at the evidence and the facts and weighed all that up. But we are not here to tell broadcasters how to run their shows. It is for them to determine how they serve the public. And I believe that in this country we are incredibly well served by some fantastic broadcasters with really high quality investigative journalism. And I want to make sure that you and your colleagues are free to be able to continue to deliver that service to the public. So I don't want you to be scared of Ofcom, but I do want everybody to feel that those standards are real and it's our job to uphold and enforce them. I'm interviewed there with Melanie Dawes. Well, let's bring in our panel, shall we? Uh, Jackie Smith, former Home Secretary, and Lord Ed Vasey, former Arts Minister. Good to have you on the programme. Former Ofcom Minister, well, in fact. Oh, well, I feel like we should go to you yeah, first. Yeah, I was... Uh, you're well, to blame, yeah, then. Okay, you, no, no. You're the... Is yeah, it it's right? all happened on my watch, the slow decay of Ofcom. No. <laughs> you're right. You're the longest-serving culture minister Yeah, ever, I was the right? broadcast minister, although I kept well out of the uh, bid for Sky, I can tell you. That was a bullet that I dodged, but... Uh, I worked very closely with Ofcom for six years as, as a minister, and I have huge respect for Ofcom. I think it's a fantastic regulator. Uh, Melanie wasn't in charge of it when I was the minister, but I think she's a fantastic uh, boss of Ofcom now. Um, and I think you've got to remember that in this country, having a regulator like Ofcom, which is pretty light touch, still does ensure that, broadly speaking, across the media landscape, the broadcast media landscape, we've got kind of fair and relatively unbiased reporting. And when you watch the news, whether it's Sky News or other news channels, you can be pretty sure you're going to get a pretty good take on the day's news without any kind of underlying bias. Now, obviously, the landscape's changing. Someone like GB News, very provocative uh, channel. You know, what happened with Lawrence Fox was just downright offensive. Yeah. It's not bias or some kind of right-wing conspiracy. It's just somebody being unbelievably offensive. And whatever channel he was on, quite rightly, Ofcom uh, would investigate. I think, you know, we do have to think through, as you were saying at the top of the programme, when you've got so much social media and so much news is consumed that way, how does Ofcom navigate that? And it has actually taken over regulation of the internet, if I can put it that way, that we've just passed the Online Safety Act. So that is its next big challenge. What's your take? Do you think that, do you agree with that, that actually, look, our broadcasting environment now is pretty unbiased and Ofcom's doing a decent job? I agree with Ed that we are lucky, uh, have been lucky up to this point with the broadcast media that we have. Largely, we haven't had the sort of populist, one-sided TV channels that we're now beginning to see uh, develop. I think the challenge is the one that you set to uh, Melanie Dawes, which is about 
the development of those channels and it's also about the range of different media outlets mm. including social media that people are now getting their uh, now getting their information and their news from and i thought i mean she has a point that it's a good thing that the rules have remained the same the rules being based on this idea that across programming you would have a, a, a broad balance but I think probably she didn't quite answer that question about how do you deal with the much more complicated world that we now find ourselves in. And particularly, I think she actually identified one of the things that I feel most uneasy about, and that's the idea that lots of people now only get their news on social media and they do tend to get a, uh, a news which sometimes you can't depend on Ofcom regulation or the, you know, the good... Uh, news values of Sky or the BBC or ITV and therefore they end up as well being taken down frankly um, rabbit holes in which they are listening to false news and lies and there's a whole range of things that we need to do in order to counteract that including better education for people about what is and is not a trustworthy source. I mean you can look at this in all sorts of different ways I mean you know all of us know that we can pick up a newspaper and we can see a story uh, depicted in a particular way so in the kind of 1980s and 1990s somebody who just read one particular newspaper was in effect disappearing down a rabbit hole it's interesting GB News is like the kind of naughty kid at the back of the class kind of chucking <laughs> paper aeroplanes at the teacher and they're probably quite pleased they've got nine complaints live with Ofcom because they want the attention and Ofcom has held back from GB News and I think with hindsight they were probably right they just wanted to see how it would settle down there's some stuff on GB News which I think is really you know, outrageous kind of anti-vax and conspiracy theories that, that are broadcast. So I think Ofcom really does have to kind of investigate these complaints properly and kind of just set the parameters. GB News is a provocative, uh, effectively centre-right news channel, but it does, it's still a broadcaster and it has to uh, follow those rules. And so Ofcom shouldn't be afraid to enforce them. And I think by waiting, it's actually given itself the space now to act. And she makes the point, doesn't she, that actually, look, diversity of broadcaster is actually, a, you know, a good thing, and she yeah. makes that argument. Um, I want to ask you a little bit as well about the story about the BBC, because we're talking a bit about um, social media crossover with broadcast, and I think that the ruling today on Gary Lineker and how people who work for the BBC and then also use social media channels um, should allow those things to kind of interplay with each other. And I just wonder if you think that they've got the kind of balance rights uh, with that. It's basically saying that, you know, while a programme's running... What are you going to say? <laughs> no, 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 while no, a programme's... No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, while a programme's running, you shouldn't be supporting a political party um, or, yeah, making tweets or whatever back at your political party at the time. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you want to watch on the television people, big characters like Gary Lineker, like others, um, and it's a good thing for the BBC and for those of us who are watching that they're on those uh, programmes. I do know people who work for the BBC in rather more lowly positions who feel a little bit hard done by about the freedom that is given to those people who are uh, more high profile and able to, to use those sorts of methods. But uh, I, I don't know. Probably the balance is about right. Mm -hmm. If you take your responsibility, uh, if, you're, if you're made to take your responsibility when you're actually doing a programme, to not cause controversy in quite the way that has been previously, without feeling that you have to sell your soul to the BBC <laughs> or, in fact, any other broadcaster that you might be working for. Yeah, I think the BBC is right to have guidelines because Gary Lineker is not a politics uh, reporter, but he does, to, to a certain extent, represent the BBC. He also represents... Uh, Chris manufacturers and other people, but um, uh, so he is entitled to his political opinion because when you watch the BBC, you want to know that the news broadcaster or the political reporter, you don't want to know what their political views are. You want to know they're approaching this impartially. But if you're watching Match of the Day and talking about whether Chelsea will ever score a goal, uh, you want to, you don't really care what Gary Lineker thinks, but You're at the same time, yes, it's, been, it's been a bit of a painful <laughs> you, uh, start to the season. I'm sorry you, about that. Um, <laughs> but if you are, but you are still the BBC, so try not to be too provocative. And I think Gary Lineker, to be fair, he, I think Jackie's absolutely right. He let down a lot of his mm. colleagues. They were actually the ones who felt uh, let down. But I think it's right that the BBC has these guidelines because, again, we're talking about this kind of multimedia world. Don't forget, of course, we as politicians, we loved. Sucking up to celebrities. You had Tracy. <laughs> you had Tracy Ullman. We had Kenny. E we had Kenny Everett. 
<laughs> uh, nobody at the time said, oh, we can't watch Kenny Everett's programmes because he's just endorsed the Tories. So it's a di and also, poor old Gary, you know, he gets used as a stick by some newspapers to beat the beat. Because the interesting thing is, I don't think I did criticise Gary Lineker, actually. I said I wanted to see people like Gary Lineker. And, of course, the interesting thing about no, Gary... No, no, the newspapers love to use okay. Gary Lineker as a way of exactly. attacking the BBC. Because, one, they want to attack the BBC, yeah, yeah. and, two, he's somebody controversial... On the left, let's not forget yeah. GB News. You called it centre right. I'm not sure. I'm not so sure about the centre bit, actually. Uh, you know, on the whole, there are far more newspapers and broadcasters who tend to be on the right, and to have somebody noisy on the left is a nice bit of balance. Um, we'll have much more from you uh, as the program uh, goes on. Jackie, Ed, thank you very much. Now, I want to talk now about Eliane and um, she was 15 years old. She was on a bus on her way to school, but she didn't make it to the classroom that morning because she was fatally stabbed with a knife. Now, a lot of the coverage and analysis has focused on the weapon that was used, but, you know, to me, this isn't just a story about knife crime, it's also a story about violence against women and girls. 198 women were murdered last year. 95% of the suspects in those killings were men. And I can't help thinking that is what we should also be talking about today while well, a vigil has been held this evening and we've been getting some reaction from the community. Being with the parents, mum, the tears just rolled down her face, the family are weeping and wailing, understandably, because of the loss of life. And um, I, I, I would appeal to every parent watching this, we don't want to ever see a parent go through what I've seen these parents go through over the last hour or so. Well, this tragedy has provoked a political row between the government and the London mayor a little earlier I caught up with Sadiq Khan. Uh, I've spent this morning in uh, Croydon, uh, spending time with local residents, youth workers, community leaders and the police. We've been working incredibly hard, not just in Croydon, but actually uh, around London, supporting young people, giving them constructive things to do, keeping them busy, particularly in the evenings when we know violent crime can go up, weekends and during the holidays and, you know, you know, my thoughts and prayers are with, with this young child's family, who, whose life will never be the same uh, again. But what we can't do is give up on uh, young people. We've got to be in, invest in them, giving them constructive things to do so they can flourish and thrive. And I'm unwilling uh, to give up on any young person. Is it right, the perception that knife crime is getting worse in London? Well, well look, I mean, one death is one death too many. Uh, and, I, and I mean that. I've seen the consequences too often, both as a member of parliament and as the mayor, what happens to a bereaved uh, family. But we're seeing the benefits of our investment. I was speaking to a youth worker today in uh, Croydon, and he shared with me that because of our investment from City Hall and the Violence Reduction Unit, that's giving young people constructive things to do after school, uh, weekends and holidays. They've not seen, uh, for almost two years, uh, a teenager killed in uh, Croydon. One death is one too many. Uh, they've also seen a reduction in relation to young people getting involved in uh, knife crime. So they're seeing some of the early signs of the progress that investment can uh, make. And we're going to carry on from City Hall, you know, with or without government support, investing in young people. At the same time, we're going to invest in the police. We need more police officers, more community support officers, so they can take off our streets uh, the knives and offensive weapons. Interesting to hear you say with or without government support. Um, the Conservative Minister, Richard Holden, said that you should be focused on bringing down knife crime rather than distractions like the ULES. What, what's your response to that? Well, I, I hope he would reflect on his comments. You know, I, I'm unwilling to use this child's death, her, her brutal killing, as a political football. I'm quite clear, though, uh, you know, since 2016, I've been making clear both the consequences of austerity, but also investing in both our police I mean, but I guess also young people defense, as well. He would say that, look, you know, after an event like this, it's natural that people look to politicians' response to it. Well, absolutely, and that's why I spent you know, a lot of time uh, yesterday with the commissioner, uh, today in Croydon, speaking to the community, listening to the community. Uh, you know, I'm quite clear. My number one priority has got to be keeping our city safe, keeping Londoners uh, uh, safe. That's why I feel so passionate about investing in young people, but also advocating for investment from our government, investment in our police uh, and, and our community support officers and, you know, the Met Police Service more generally, investment in public services, schools, youth workers, youth clubs, giving young people constructive things to do. I don't believe and I don't, I don't subscribe to the point of view that crime is inevitable, that knife crime is inevitable. I think it's preventable and we've shown the progress that can be made 
made invest in young people. Sadiq Khan there, seek to speak to be at City Hall. Up next on the Politics Hub, we'll get a reaction to that interview from our panel, Ed Basie and Jackie Smith. and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. Now they're trying to finish the job off so that they can move into the square. Okay, it's okay, don't worry, it's okay. They're becoming very sensitive about having the media around. They have no protective masks or protective equipment at all. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in news. Every time they touch them, they spray, spray, spray. This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. Perilously close to the vineyards. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. Five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Hello, welcome back. You're watching the Politics Hub. Now, just before the break, we were hearing from the London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, about knife crime in London. That's following the death of a 15-year-old girl in Croydon. So we can get a bit more reaction now from uh, Jackie and Ed to that story. Jackie, I was quite struck when Sadiq Khan said he doesn't think knife crime and crime is inevitable, but it's preventable. I mean, you, as a former Home Secretary, is he, is he right? Well, I was very pleased to hear him say that. Um, you know, th we're faced today with a terrible tragedy. Um, each uh, ex episode of knife crime is, um, but we need to, to believe that there is something that we can do about it. Otherwise, all we see is a descent into political bickering, which is the most unsavoury part of this terrible tragedy. Um, of course, I think there are things that we can do. You know, frankly, when I was Home Secretary, I did work with the London Mayor, who at that point was Boris Johnson. Um, we didn't, either of us, I think, try to shift the blame from one to another. And we also recognised that there has to be a uh, joined up approach, horrible cliche, sorry, but that there, there has to be an approach that takes in a whole range of different services, as Sadiq was explaining. So you thought Boris to... Johnson was actually OK to work with, or it was London Mayor, on, on the stuff? You, you're pushing me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am, yeah. That's my job, sorry. Um, he was, um, yeah, he was, you know, he was serious about tackling crime, as is uh, Sadiq. And, of course, knife crime isn't only a problem that impacts in London, although, of course, this tragedy has highlighted London. Let's not forget, the largest, without, without playing political games, the biggest increase in knife crime, the highest rate of knife crime, is in the West Midlands. Mm. That isn't a Conservative mayor. So let's not, a, a Labour mayor, sorry, let's not make this a political uh, mat a sh a slanging match, let's think about what the solutions are. And that is policing, 
but it's also about a whole range of other services as well that have to row in behind giving young people hope, making it clear to them that they are not safer when they carry knives, because that's quite often the reason why particularly young men uh, carry knives, that there are other opportunities and high expectations and opportunities for our young people. A whole range of those things need to come into place if we're going to tackle knife crime in the way in which actually we successfully did in the last Labour government. It's the point, isn't it, about the relationship between the London mayor and the government? It feels pretty bad at the minute. Yeah, it's very bad. I mean, obviously, this is a terrible tragedy. This poor girl, 15, her whole life ahead of her, just gone in a, in a rash and stupid act, uh, murdered on a bus. I mean, it's appalling. But, uh, and I totally agree with Jackie, it shouldn't be political, although, obviously, crime does feature in campaigns, election campaigns. <clears throat> tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. People do make an issue of crime at uh, election time. I don't think it's helpful today to be saying things like, you should concentrate on knife crime and not on ULIS. I think that's a fatuous right, so that's comment the, to make. You're talking about Rich, Rich yeah, Holden, I think that's the Conservative Minister. a fatuous Minister. comment to make, particularly on a day like this. Uh, but if, you're, if I'm being blunt about it, you know, this will probably be an issue at the, at the Merrill uh, election. And Jackie knows a lot more about this subject than I do, but I obviously completely agree with her. I mean, if you're going to tackle knife, knife crime, you've got to be relentless. You've got to be both soft in terms of giving young people opportunities and ways out of this way of life, but you've also got to be very tough and have a kind of zero tolerance approach to, to kids who carry knives and make sure that they are uh, stopped and caught and uh, p potentially punished uh, as well. The other thing to say, by the way, again, is that in this country we are fortunate, I think, in terms of, you know, every death is a tragedy, but we do not have the murder rates of some other mm. Western uh, cities that are comparable to London. So we should always remember that we have still a great system of policing and London is still a safe city, which mm -hmm. is important. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely right. Thank you both uh, for discussion on that. Coming up next on The Politics Hub. We're going to be looking ahead to a Scottish by-election test for Keir Starmer and whether his party has U-turned on private schools.
Hello, welcome back to The Politics Hub. OK, well, let's have a look now, shall we, at some stories that we've been covering on our digital politics hub, which has been across all of today's developments as usual. The first one uh, to bring you now, with all due respect to myself, the interviews that every Prime Minister fears more than any other is a traditional round of regional... Where we are? Oh. Yeah, this is it, this is it. Here we go. Regional interviews uh, before conference, a minefield of local issues that are just waiting to explode if any false steps are made. Now, Rishi Sunak has endured that a lot today. A lot of questions about HS2, didn't give much in the way of answers, but have a look at this. This is one of the lines that has emerged. He's refused to say how much the Bibby Stockholm migrant barge plan would cost. He just said that it was a viable plan. Now, that plan, of course, is designed to help meet one of the Prime Minister's key pledges on stopping the boats. This is our pledge tracker you can see here, the five pledges, and uh, you can see the stop the boats pledge here. Now, you can have a play with that at home. This is our, basically, we're just trying to keep tabs on how he's doing on all those, these uh, pledges, slightly lower than last year. You can see there the number of people crossing in small boats. Now, we're heading off to Conservative Conference in Manchester over the weekend, and... You can get into the spirit of things by reading our political reporter Tim Baker's top 10 conference moments from the ladies not for turning all the way to Theresa May's coughing fit. That is a great read, I can tell you that. Now, if you scan the QR code, you can catch up with all of the latest on The Hub throughout the day. We can bring you more now on the story that we broke last night, a U-turn by the party on its plans to remove the charitable status of private schools. Now, it's not perhaps the most reassuring sign when a politician tells you that nothing has changed, conjuring up memories of Theresa May's climb down on social care, remember that one. But that does seem to be the Labour line today. We're going to have more on the politics of this in a moment. But first, our political, political correspondent, Tamara Cohen, has been looking at the possible impact on schools. It's schools like LVS Ascot, costing thousands of pounds a term, that Labour have in their sights. Pupils enjoy the best facilities and class sizes of just 20, with plenty of room for individual attention. Labour say these schools should be paying more tax, VAT at 20% and full business rates. The head teacher says if fees go up, some pupils would have to leave. Why should an expensive school like this get what's effectively a tax break? It's not a tax break because parents have actually, they've already paid their taxes for state school places, so that really shouldn't they have some relief from it as well? And I think parents have a, a right, and children have a right to a, a good education, especially those children where they need some, maybe some special needs or they have you know, a particular turn as well. So they have a right to choose their education. Schools are looking and working with tax specialists to ensure that there's minimum damage a minimum that we pass on to our parents in the future. So you won't go down without a fight? No way. Bring it on, Mr Starmer. Michaela, whose teenage daughter goes to the school, is worried about the impact. We don't have an extravagant lifestyle. We're not out every night of the week dining out. You know, we are just what I would class as a very normal family. But, yeah, you make sacrifices that the money we, we earn goes on school fees. Labour say the policy would raise up to £1.7 billion. Private schools say the policy could raise a lot less money if significant numbers of pupils leave schools like this one and have to be educated in the state sector instead. No one knows exactly how many parents will make that choice, but it will have an impact on whether Labour's numbers add up. Labour had initially wanted to stop private schools registering as charities, but now say that's too complicated and just hiking their taxes would be quicker. Ending VAT is something that can be done quickly and that money then can go into the state sex sector. The vast majority of children in this country go to state schools. We want every state school to be excellent. And that's why, uh, by ending the tax loopholes, the VAT and the business rates for private schools, that money can go into those state schools. Independent experts say it should raise the amounts Labour suggest. That seems like a perfectly reasonable estimate, given that we've had an increase in fees of something more than a half over the last 20 years or so and no reduction whatever in the numbers going to private school. There's no particular reason to think this will have a big effect on the numbers going. Keir Starmer insists there's no U-turn and they are confident their plans will work. The Conservatives hope the whole policy will misfire with voters. Tamara Cohen, Sky News, Berkshire. Right, let's bring in Jackie and Ed, shall we? Jackie, what do you make of this policy? 
I think this is a sign that Labour thinks they're going to get into government and is finding pragmatic ways to raise the money that they want to invest in public services. Um, it strikes me that it is perfectly reasonable to say that um, if, you, if you currently have tax breaks, which some people might consider are unreasonable, you take them away, you take your £1.7 billion, you spend it on children who don't have the opportunity to have some of the um, special facilities that we were seeing in, in that piece. It reminds me a bit of 1997, when Labour came into government with the promise to remove the assisted places scheme, which equally was taxpayers' money being spent to benefit a few children going into private schools, and they used it to reduce class sizes. Just explain sizes. what it is. What is the assisted... What, what... So the assisted places scheme back then was a scheme by which public money was used to support a few children to take them out of state schools and put them into private schools. What we actually did was to do away with the scheme and we spent the money that was saved from that on reducing class sizes for all five, six and seven year olds. Exactly the same arguments we used at that time. It, it's terrible, it's going to, to cause uh, state schools to come under too much pressure because children are going to have to come back into them. All of those scare stories, none of them came true, but children in state schools had smaller class sizes. Uh, well, it's class warfare, oh, uh, in, so. uh, in the true sense of the word, <laughs> uh, because the parents who send their kids to Eton will not be affected by this. They can absorb the increase in fees. But the parents who save hard to send their kids to quite a small, nondescript private school, because that's their choice, they might save up and send them at sixth form, for example. I was talking to uh, a prominent Westminster commentator today who described exactly that's what his parents did for him. But it's not too uh, bad. And they are, state they, school, they, they are, like kind of they are, well, if, it, it's a choice, isn't it? And if, if your parents decide to do that, those are the schools uh, that will go to the wall and it's kind of a uh, pointless kind of vindictive act. Although I would say, I would agree with Jackie that it is a sign of Labour taking government seriously because they knew that trying to abolish charitable status because educations are, education institutions are charities and getting into that quagmire would have been impossible. So they basically signalled, we're going to act quickly and we're going to introduce this policy in the simplest way possible. That's grown-up approach to being in opposition. I just happen not to agree with the policy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is that why they've done this then? Because they've just looked at the charitable states and they hang, hang on, this is a lot yeah, more complicated than we thought. I mean, part of the argument that Labour spokespeople are making is that we never meant what we said about charitable status. But, but I think the truth on. is yeah. that they did look at it. I mean, charity law is an absolute... Yeah. You do not want to get into that. Definitely. And actually, of course, the reason the charitable status was shorthand for we don't want you to have preferential tax treatment no. um, as a result of being a private school. So they will be removing the right to VAT relief and business rates relief. That will raise £1.7 billion. That can then be spent elsewhere. And remember, the other problem that Labour has is they want to make commitments about improving public services like schools, but quite rightly, they're coming under the challenge and they're very sensitive of this as to where do you find the money. Mm. So this is a clear way in which money is being taken from a few, dare I say, and being spent for the it's benefit of It's not going to raise many. the money, of course, because the minute what? you start charging VAT on school fees, you start offsetting VAT on the money what? you're spending on the fabric of your school as well. So it's not going to oh, raise Paul, the Paul Johnson from the Paul pounds. Johnson from the IFS is not usually somebody who, who you wouldn't trust, is he? And he said I he thought it would Paul raise... With it my will life. raise one point seven billion. I stand corrected then. <laughs> That's it, I love that. Brilliant <laughs> quote. Uh, now, let's stay with Labour. Now, I just want to take you over here, because you'd perhaps be forgiven if you were unaware of an important bilateral coming up this time next week, but the vote in Rutherglen and Hamilton West triggered by the ousting of the SNP MP Margaret Ferrier after her breach of Covid rules, it, well, this could actually provide the best indication yet of whether a Labour revival in Scotland is actually underway, something that Keir Starmer really needs if he's going to secure a majority at the general election. I can see this is the 2019 result there. SNP clearly winning that seat with 23,000 votes, 44.2 per cent share. Labour in second place with 18,500 votes and a 34.5% share. Can they take it next time? Let's try and find out, shall we? Um, Jackie, you feeling confident? People are working very hard. Uh, they're running the campaign on the basis that I suspect the next general election will be, which is cost of living pressures, uh, what's happening in the NHS. And as you say, it'll be an interesting test. You know, I'm not going to get carried, uh, carried away. Um, but uh, I think they're running a, a good campaign. It's less easy, of course, in Scotland because you are fighting 
both mm. the SNP and the Tories. It's not the st straightforward fight that you would tend to have in, in England. But... You're, you're in a bit of a weird position, the Conservatives, aren't you? Because to sort of stop Keir Starmer getting majority, you need the SNP to do quite well, don't you? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, uh, the, one of the routes back to power for Labour is to knock the SNP sideways in Scotland, and it was looking like it was going that way, obviously, with the problems that happened with Nicola Sturgeon after she stood down as First Minister. Um, there was a poll quite recently which showed the SNP sort of coming back, which should worry Labour. And regardless of your politics, this by-election is a test for Labour. If they don't beat the SNP here, and I don't think it is a two-horse race, uh, two, three-horse race, as it were, because you look where the Tories are in that poll, uh, in, in, that, in that election result, um, if they don't beat the SNP, it's going to be a big, big blow. It's just a fact, I'm afraid. Well, you would say that, wouldn't you? No, no, I, I think that is <laughs> anyone. Anyone would say that, <laughs> apart from Jackie Smith on live television, <laughs> trying to kind of you know, roll is, a, roll. It's a test. Expectations it's a test, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Of course yeah. it's a test. If you're in opposition and you're in the run-up to a general election and you're doing quite well, every by-election is a test. But not every by-election tells you what's going to happen in I mean, the end. In the I mean, they, they, they do have an impact. I mean, Uxbridge gave the Tories a boost and has set off this whole kind of climate change row. And, of course, the Nadine Dorries by-election is going to be fascinating because that is a genuine mm. three-way race. And if the Tories come through the middle, that will have some kind of resonance, mm. even though, statistically, it may look like they've done disastrously badly. If Labour and the Lib Dems run each other neck and neck and the Tories mm. come through the middle, that will give the Tories there a big are, boost. There are interesting by-elections to come. I think that's Love one that. thing that we can <laughs> all agree on. May you live in interesting by-election times. <laughs> Indeed. Do you, um, do you think the Conservatives are going to win the next election? General election? I've... <laughs> Well, let me let me let me do <laughs> my laugh. best Jackie Smith uh, <laughs> impression. Come on, no, our I, 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 I think it's interesting. I mean, I think that Cameron, when he uh, got a hung Parliament, I think the public, I think there's a kind of process of osmosis. The public had said, I, "We don't want a Labour government, but we're not sure about the Tories." I thought we were in the position where the public was saying, "We don't want a Tory government, uh, but we're not sure we want Labour." And I've kind of held to that position. I've occasionally thought they're going to give Labour a majority. I thought partly because of what's going to happen to the SNP in Scotland. Uh, but I may be coming back to that. I don't think the Tories are going to have a majority in the next election. What about Labour? Majority? We need... So I was elected to Parliament in 1997. Labour needs to do as well, if not better, than we did in 1997 to get a majority. She's managing the That's how difficult again. Very good, it isn't it? Is. Very good management of expectations. <laughs> I should have said that. It's so are you the do truth. It? Um, I should have said that. The Tories are going to win the next election. <laughs> Because Labour can't, can't do That's this. That's not managing expectations, though, is it? <laughs> You're doing the opposite. <laughs> Listen, Labour in, in a good position. Keir Starmer is, I think, you know, has achieved some good by-election results as well. But there is an awful long way to go between now and the general that's, election. That's definitely true. We can all agree on that one. Um, right, up next on The Politics Hub. After the US Secretary of State wowed the crowds with his musical chops, we take a look at other attempts by politicians to strike a chord with the current public. Andy and Bear, also called Spectacle Bear, because they have these sort of beautiful, beautiful blonde markings on the face, which uh, can look like spectacles, and... Uh, they come from the Andes, as you've mentioned. So they, they range down from um, Venezuela, you know, down through Ecuador, Colombia, following the Andean range right down to Bolivia. But there are only 10,000 left. So we were very fortunate to uh, receive a mail just uh, a few months ago. He came to us as part of a, a love swap, really. So we exchanged a mail. We had a male here who went to a zoo out in, on the south coast. The, that zoo sent a mail up to us, Oberon. Uh, to be paired with our female patcher, and we quite quite a sort of tightly coordinated operation because both zoos had to exchange animals at the same time. They had to leave at the same time, past each other somewhere along the M1. And uh, he's here now, and paired with patcher, and we're awaiting the I guess the pitter patter of tiny bare feet at some point in the future. Like a lot of species these days, unfortunately, they're uh, where sort of human populations and communities are expanding. We're sort of coming into 
sharing areas, wild areas with wild animals. And this is the case for the Andean bear. So um, there's a lot of farming that goes on in throughout the Andean bears range, um, cattle ranching as well. And inevitably, you know, these animals in the wild would eat a sort of variety of vegetables, cactus, flowers, bromeliads, things like that. But if they come across a cornfield, that's an absolute bonanza. You know, they'll have a, a field day, literally. Likewise, they, the males especially, they're quite large. Uh, they can take uh, mainly sick cattle. Uh, so obviously, if you're a farmer, that's uh, not great for you. So there's inevitable conflict between sort of bears and local communities. But uh, but we do work with um we work with our partners out in out in Bolivia where we're sort of looking really to mitigate these threats through sort of education and also trying to provide sort of alternative livelihoods alternative sources of income for these communities so so that wildlife conflict doesn't occur. I'm Martha Kalner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. Are you still the kingmaker of this Republican Party? I've interviewed some of America's most recognisable politicians and celebrities too. Hello, welcome back to The Politics Hub, your source for all of the day's political news and analysis. Now, the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, is known for his rather sober approach to international diplomacy. But last night, he revealed what to many might be a hidden talent to showcase a new music diplomacy project by the US government. Then the world will know who she could be man for no Everybody knows I'm here. Well, I love who she could be man. Everybody knows I'm here. Seriously, pretty good. Uh, now, that's us thinking about what other politicians, past and present, have shown a bit of musical prowess. Some better than others, fair to say, probably. I think you, I think you picked some unflattering clips of Tony Blair. I think he was better on the guitar than that. You think it's he's very, a bit cooler very than annoying. That? I mean, I wish I could play a musical instrument. You told me playing play the playing the blues guitar is actually, I think, something you can teach yourself. Robert Courts, the MP for Whitney, has taught himself the blues guitar, and you can go on his Instagram occasionally, and he'll play a very mean tune, but of course you have the parliamentary band MP4. Absolutely. Pete Wishart, yeah. who I think was, was in Run Rig or something. He was, yeah. Uh, there was Greg Knight, I can't even yeah. remember if he's still an MP. Yeah. And you're a drummer, uh, you're a drummer uh, right? Well, I learned the drums when I was a kid, but the other one, uh, Labour, here's a plus point for Labour, you don't have to have your bets on this one. <laughs> their art spokesman, <laughs> their Ed Vasey, Tangam Debonair, oh, yes. is yes. Yes. a v concert Quality violinist, is Chellis. that Chellis. Yeah, Chellis. 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 Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, she is, yeah. you're right. To uh, the Royal is. College of Music or something like that. Yeah. 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 Proper full on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No she's, messing and they're in about. a band. They've got a band as well, right? I can't remember what it's called, but. Um, oh, have they? I um, think uh, Kathy Newman's in it as well. Uh, string Quartet. That's I don't, right. I don't think you call it a band. I don't know. Do yeah. You? There's a String Quartet. And <laughs> I'm a bit a, more of a band than a String Quartet. And there's a House of Lords doorkeeper who's a mean trombonist who plays in a pub down by the Tower of London every night, every Friday night. Um, have you got any musical qualities or...? I, uh, I've got grade six piano. That's good. That's pretty good. And grade six cello. That's good. Yeah, but the cello's been in the, the, the attic for an awful, awful long time. That's not bad, though. We should have 
Quite what about you? What do you play? I've done a bit of piano. So, but I mean, I'm not. I'll be... I just think the way piano is taught is so bad. You know, you get. I tried, did try to learn as an adult. And you get, you know, you've got to practice your scales. So you should be given. Teacher, well, I, I, I do. I, I'm blaming I my tools. I didn't do grades with piano, so it was much more fun. I just exactly. Because I didn't want to have to do the scales. And stuff. But you did this uh, at school, as it were. Uh, or no, as an adult? just as a, well, no, like as a teenager. I haven't yeah. played for years. I went to university. But that's and then the best stopped. way to learn, isn't it? <laughs> Rather than boring scales, you play a tune yeah. that you can recognise. No, you see, I was a bit of a goody goody so I like to do the scales and the exams and show so, and I, because I don't have that much creativity I'm afraid to say. Mm. Mm. Well, um, we should have got you to bring the drums and the cello yeah, we could have, in. That would have been quite amazing. <laughs> next time, <laughs> next Thursday? Yeah, yeah well we yeah, go, I gather we're now on every Thursday, Jeff. did you hear that? <laughs> I think Apparently we're now just to warn yeah, you guys. permanently. Yeah, we might see a few more of these two. <laughs> How, how's Ian Dale going to cope? <laughs> It'll be tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you guys going to conference? What's the plan? Yeah, I'm going up uh, to Manchester on Monday. I'm taking a flying... Tory conference. A flying visit to Manchester to the Tory party conference to do my podcast mm. live for the many. I am going to Labour for the whole weekend, but only for the weekend. Um, yeah. It's interesting to um, go behind enemy lines, if you like. How do you find the difference between Labour and Conservatives? Well, I was at the Lib Dems last week. Oh, wow. Um... Lib Dems, they are fun and enthusiastic with some rather strange outfits. <laughs> the Tories, they all, they all look a bit the same. Slightly boring, it's a bit rude, slightly it? old. It's quite interesting. I mean, conferences, conferences are obviously a snapshot of what uh, the political situation and people will say, I bet that the Labour Party conference is completely buzzing, full of businesses, sucking up to the next government. And the Tory one may be a bit flat. So actually going to Tory conference would be quite interesting. Uh, we've got to go. I can really tell good to have from you your both. Did you hear my movement. pointing? I was like, I, I, I think I've got 10 seconds. Shut up. I'm not even sure if I'm going to make it over here, but I'm going to try. <laughs> if you scan the QR code, you can catch up with all the latest on the hub throughout the day. I can't believe I managed to finish my script. Good night. <laughs> See you on Monday. <laughs>